home. Maybe it's just the city where we grew up or the place we go back to for the holidays. Maybe it's the place we just left and miss more than we ever thought we would. Home is hard to leave, but it's even harder to find because the most compelling part of home is not a place, it's the people we found there. And yet we find ourselves here, together. What if we let home be more than just a zip code, but stories and life and laughter? What if home was a commitment to showing up fully, exactly where we are? Could it be here? Could it be now? Could home be us? We think so. Welcome home. Today we're kicking off a new series, and it's called Home. Interestingly enough, something you did last Sunday inspired this series. So if you remember, uh, I asked a question last week asking how many of us had relocated to the Lake Nona area. And when I saw how many hands shot up into the air, God began to stir something in my heart. I wrote in an email this week that I really counted a privilege to be your pastor. I woke up with that thought on Monday. But beyond that, I also woke up with a sense that God was stirring a message in my heart that was different than what we had planned for the early parts of the fall. And so it had everything to do with this idea of transition. But if you know anything about me, you know that I can be a little bit crazy, borderline crazy. And so me making decisions on my own isn't always the best idea. And so uh, Monday morning, I went to our team and I sat down with them and I said, hey, here's the thought that I've got. I know it's going to take a lot for us. It's going to take us putting together a video piece in the next 72 hours. It's going to take us scrapping everything that we thought about doing for the first couple of weeks of the fall. I only want to do this if you think it's the right move for our church. And our team was unanimous in saying, yes, this is a word that the Lord has placed in us for this season and for this moment. And so by God's grace, we're here today teaching content we didn't even think about uh, just eight days ago. But the Lord really birthed something in us that we're excited to bring to you as a church family and as a team over the next couple of weeks. And it really starts <laughs> with probably the biggest, clunkiest, most wordy concept or big idea I have ever come up in my 10 years of preaching with. And I want you guys to write it down in your notes. I actually asked the person who built, prints our bulletins to give you more white space so you could write it down. Uh, but this is the theme for us over the next couple of days. Go ahead and write it down. It says this, where you are all right, I'll say it slowly. Where you are isn't where you were. Is that true? Where you are isn't where you were. And where you are may not be where you're going. But where you are is where you are. And what you decide to do with where you are will make you ready for where you're going and make sense of why you are no longer where you were. It might be easier just to take a photo of the screen <laughs> than to try and write that down. But I want to say it one more time, because this really is the, the thing that I think God's birthed in our heart for the next couple of weeks. Where you are isn't where you were. And where you are may not be where you're going. But where you are is where you are. And what you decide to do with where you are will make you ready for where you're going and make sense of why you are no longer where you were. Here's what I'm getting at. You and I, we live in this tension, in a land between. We live in between where we were and where we're going, especially in a city like Orlando that's ranked 20th in the nation as the most transient place to live. And our tendency, it's, it's human nature, is to miss what God is doing where we are because we're either looking back or we're looking forward. And I think God gives us some perspective on what he actually wants from us. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 18 and 19, this is what the uh, scripture tells us. It says, forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Do, do you not see it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The reality is, is some of us, as we come to church even today, some of us are living in where we were. We're living in that neighborhood and those friends and that former community and that old job and that old boss, and that's where life is for us. We're dwelling and we're living in the past. And God says to us, if you live in the past, if that's where your life is, back when things were great, back when things used to be that way, that, that's where our life is. We will miss, we will be blind to, we won't be able to see what God is doing right now. 
But for some of us, that's not the issue. The the issue is actually that we live so far out in the future, and we spend our time all the way out there that we miss the moment right now, too. Matthew 6, 34, these are Jesus' words. He says, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. If you focus too much on the past and what you had, you'll never see what I'm doing, what, now. So some of us live over here, And we're so concerned about what's around the corner and what's going to happen, right? We've got so much stuff stockpiled up for the next 12 hurricanes at our house because we're so stressed out about what's coming around the corner. And some of us are living where the way things were, wishing we could just go back to that. And some of us are living over here thinking, I can't wait till I can just get out of the situation that I'm in. New job, new opportunity, new city, new friends, new experience. And if we live over here, we'll miss what God is doing now. There's a tension that I think is so important for us to acknowledge, that we live in this tension, don't we? We live in where we were, and then we live in where we're going, and and God says, well, you are where you are right now. So where do you tend to live? Do you tend to live in the past this is people who live in the past. You kind of have this attitude. It's one that I'm used to too. Man, I wish things could just go back to the way they were. Has anybody ever said that before? I miss those people, that coffee shop, that season of life, that size waist. Can I get an amen? <laughs> you know, life before the muffin top, right? The wrinkles, or in my case, the rapidly receding hairline. I tell Stacy all the time, baby, this is as good as it gets. It is all downhill from here. And what she says, no, 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 it's all uphill from here, Colin. It's all uphill from here. Or do you live in the future? Do you get fixed on what's next or what's coming around the corner? I can't wait until I get that promotion or we can move overseas or get married, hit that life stage or just get our kids out of diapers. Please, dear Jesus, let that time come quickly or would you return, right? That kind of perspective. I love my kids, but sometimes they can be a handful. There's a moment this, this week just, that just went by where uh, in my living room, Emma kept on saying, Dad, 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 right? This just, just oh, over and over and over again. Elise is in this stage where she's watching these TV shows about animals and learning what animal sounds make. And so she, at the same time as Emma is saying, Dad, 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 is going, ah, woo, ah, woo. Daddy, did you know that's what a blue whale makes? Ah, woo! And I'm like, no, that's what the most annoying animal on the planet, that's the sound that that makes, right? Jackson is just hangry. He's literally throwing a tantrum in the middle of our living room. And I'm just wondering, is Ali still alive? Where is he? Like, that's the space that I'm in with my four kids. And I had this moment, I'll be honest with you, where as all of this loudness was going on, in the back of my mind, all I could say is, I cannot wait until these kids grow up and get up out of my house. Like, I had that thought. I was living in the future. Because if we're honest, if we're honest, some of us really wish we could go back to the way things were. And some of us really wish that we could just get out of the situation we are in and move on. But here's the thing. We are where we are. We live where we live. We're doing what we're doing. And God has a purpose for the season we're in. The bottom line is that life can be hard because it's full of transition, isn't it? Someone asked me recently, do you ever think life will just settle down and we won't have to go through transition? And I was like, yes, when we die. Like that is the time in which it'll happen. Because transition, it's inevitable, isn't it? Leaving home, that that place you knew how things worked, You knew how people were. You knew what the weather was going to be like. You knew how your boss thought about life. Leaving home can be hard. But I think for most of us, finding home can be even harder. Because we have a history, don't we? And every time we move, we wonder if it's even worth trying to find home again. And one of the things I love about the Bible is that it is filled with stories and people who left home and had to find home again in the midst of a different culture, a different value system, and a different people. It's filled with stories of people who had to go somewhere else, start over again, try it again. 
people like Abraham and Moses and Joshua, people like David, Daniel, Esther, and Ruth. And what I love is that our God is kind. He's a kind and good heavenly father that doesn't look at our situations of transition and say, you know what, figure that one out on your own, grow some big boy pants. He doesn't do that. But instead what he does is he invites us into, through his word, some real tangible ways where we can experience what it's like to find home again. That we can make some decisions and choices that allow us to actually embrace where we are and as a result of that, get prepared for where we're going and have a perspective on why we had to leave where we were in the first place. And that's what this series is all about. It's about helping us find home in the midst of transition. Do you feel like you're in transition a little bit? For some of us, this is as literal as a fact that you just moved here from somewhere else, right? And you're looking at the houses with stucco, enduring this crazy humidity, right? There's like no point in even doing your hair anymore. Navigating toll roads and finding new sports teams for your kids. That's the season of transition that you're in right now. For others of us, it's the fact that we're in the middle of a different kind of change. It's a new job, it's a new boss. It's a new company, it's a a new diagnosis, it's a new season of life as new babies are born or as our little babies grew up to become older babies and they're now out of the house and we look at each other and we think, how in the world is home gonna work out with just me and you in the house now? And all of us are in this process of rediscovering home again. For all of us, if we're followers of Jesus, It's even more so the fact that we're in this spiritual reality that our real home is never meant to be like Nona but heaven, right? And we won't ever really be home until we meet him or till Jesus returns. But in the meantime, right, in that land between, we've got to deal with the fact that we're here. And what do we do with right now? What do we do with this season? How do we find home between where we were and where we're going. It's the exact same questions the Israelites were asking God as they were being relocated into Babylon. You know, there's a powerful king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar who conquered the people of Israel. And history records that the best and the brightest Israelites were taken to this new city called Babylon where they were held, the word is, in exile. It would be 70 years or at least two generations, if not three or four, before the Israelites would return home to their city And for the people that remained in Israel during that time, they didn't go to Babylon. Their situation seemed to be even more dire. At first, things seemed to be going well. You may not have heard of this guy before, but there was a guy by the name of Jedidalia. If you're looking for a name for your son, maybe that will work. Jedidalia, say that five times fast. He was appointed by King Nebuchadnezzar, and and for the sake of time, I'm just going to call him Jed. And, And the people who were left in Jerusalem were under the leadership of Jed. And for this small season of time, it felt like home again. Because the economy began to prosper and things began to go well well, until, history tells us, Jedidalia, Jed, was actually murdered. And that led to another upheaval in the city of Jerusalem. And the people that were living there actually had to move out again to Egypt. And it's in that context that we're going to read some of Jeremiah's words. Jeremiah writes to both the people in Egypt and Babylon in the verses we're going to read that we're no longer where they were and we're learning how to live where they are. Do you feel like you're learning how to live where you are? New friends, new season, new city, new job, new community. So imagine this, you're living in a certain place that your family has known for years, but the jobs are drying up, the economy isn't strong enough to sustain itself, the educational options for your kids aren't good and their potential safety is at risk. So you decide over the dinner table one night that you're gonna pack up your bags for the sake of your family, move to the city where there's opportunity. How many of us had a conversation like that? And that's part of the reason why we're here. It's what's best for the job. It's what's best for the family. It's what we need to do. It's what the organization is saying we've got to do if we want to keep our job or find our next fit. Does that sound familiar? How many of us decided to move either because we were told by our boss we had to or because we saw our situation and thought this is not what is best for our family? And as you're moving... <laughs> Let's be honest, we begin to miss the local spots that we just love. Our kids start complaining about the fact that they miss their old town and their old friends and their own old city and their old school. And the kids here are so different. And why can't we just go back? It's a new culture and there's new pressures. And everyone in Babylon wears these ugly things called flip-flops. 
They shop at this weird place called Publix. They drink this sweet, nasty tea, you know, called sweet tea. And everyone is a terrible chariot driver. It's like, how in the world do these people get licenses in the first place? And you just want to go back, don't you? Or maybe you're, you're just looking forward to getting out and getting on and going somewhere else. Let's just get overseas. Let's just do this for a couple of years and go somewhere else. We are not living here. And in the middle of that tension and in that space is where God writes a letter through the prophet Jeremiah. And he tells them what they ought to do with the situation they're in, they, they, what they ought to do with the tension between where they were and where they're going, with, with where they are. And he gives it to them in three simple verses that I want to unpack over the next couple of weeks. He says this in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 5 through 7. He says, build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food that they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away, and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you in exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. I am convinced that these three verses carry the principles that are essential if we're going to find home again, if we're going to flourish in this new land or in this new space we call home. And I want to start today with the first decision that has to happen if you're going to thrive in the middle of where you are or where you were and where you're going. And it starts with one choice, and if I could be honest with you, it is the hardest choice. But it's the decision we all have to make if we're going to thrive in the season we're in. And it's three words, plan to stay. Plan to stay. I think it's interesting as I even say that phrase, plan to stay, that hits us in different ways, doesn't it? Because there's something so permanent about it. But I want you to know that as we read the text, we see God tell us, build homes and plan to stay. That until we make that decision in our mind and in our heart, that this is home, and that this is the job that I'm going to work, and these are the people that I'm going to do life with, and this is the community that I'm going to be a part of. Until we make that decision, we'll never be able to experience what God has for us right now. So how do we plan to stay? The scripture gives us three specific ways, and I want to give them to you today. The first one is this. Invest where you are. Write that down. If I want to plan to stay, I've got to invest where I am. In the text, God tells his people to build homes. And we see this all the time in Lake Nona, don't we? Homes being built, you guys notice that? And when you build a home, especially a new one in Lake Nona, you put a deposit down on the house, they tell you it's gonna take about eight months to build, and then two and a half years later, you're still waiting on your house, right? That's what happens. But there's a very big difference, right, between owning a home and renting one. When you rent a home, if something breaks, you call the landlord and they fix it, right? It's a beautiful situation. But when you own a home and something breaks, guess who's gotta fix it? You. And you care about how it's fixed a lot more because it's your investment. The home you're building becomes the investment that you want to protect. When you own a home and something breaks, you fix it because you're invested. And the same thing's true about our spiritual lives. Let me ask you this question. Are we renting relationships with people or are we investing in them? Think about your friends. Think about the people that you're in relationship with. Are we renting relationships with people? Or are we investing in them because we actually are planning to stay? You see, the temptation to isolate and disengage and consume instead of contribute is natural to us if we haven't planned to stay. And our relationships in our own souls suffer as a result. Am I investing in relationships? Am I investing where I am in my business, with my coworkers, with my friends, with my neighbors, and in my community, or am I just renting them? Here's a second reality. Be patient with the process. The scripture says build homes, but it also says plant gardens. You don't spend the time to plant a garden unless you're willing to wait around to see the harvest. Planting takes time, sweat, energy, and tears, which is why I've never planted a garden in my life. It's the idea of investing in something that doesn't produce immediate results. It's about putting down roots, knowing that there won't be an immediate fruit or return on that initial investment, but that's the weight that we're willing, and that's the price that we're willing to pay because it's worth it. Because when we plant roots, we're choosing to cultivate the places and the people that God has given us to steward. It's choosing to get our hands dirty with the hard work of relationship because the fruit is worth it. 
Like I'm so ecstatic about the number of people that signed up to join community groups are in community groups out of the 19 that we've got here at our church. It's, it's really exciting to me. But here's what I know. That some of us went to community group this week or will go to community group this week. We'll go there. We'll be there for an hour and change. We'll get in our car. We'll look at our friends. We'll look at our spouse. We'll look at our kids, whoever, and say, not doing that again, right? Because it takes time for relationship to be built. And we live in a microwave society that says, I should press a button in 35 seconds, pop, 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 new friends. And that's not the way life happens. It takes time. It's like planting a garden. And it's a process. But here's what I'm learning about life. Did you know that the best things in life are worth waiting for and the best things in life actually take time and hard work? The text goes on to say, eat the food that they produce. You know, what's interesting is the culture of Babylon, the, the land in Babylon was different than the land in Jerusalem. Because the land was different, it meant that there were different crops that were going to grow during different seasons of time. So what they used to eat in Jerusalem, they weren't going to be able to eat in Babylon anymore because the land was different, which meant the fruit was different. And I think some of us need to realize that, that our responsibility is to eat the, fruit, the food that's being produced in the season of life we're in now. We're probably not going to have the same relationships we had five years ago. We're probably not going to have the same relationships we had 15 years ago when we were in college. We're probably not going to have the marriage we had 10 years ago. It's probably not coming back because that was being produced in a season of our life. But we're in new land now. And there's new relationships that need to be built. And there's new conversations that need to be started. And there's a new journey that God has us on. And the sustenance we need is in the food that's being produced right now and the ground that we're tilling and the relationships that we're building. And if in our mind we think, if I could just go back to here and eat that food and be a part of those relationships, we've got to realize those crops aren't there anymore. And until we embrace where we are now, we will starve, wondering why. And the reason is because we aren't nurturing the season we're in. We gotta be willing to be patient with the process. We used to like how our old boss did things, but now we've gotta to learn to embrace the new one we've got. We used to like the way that we used to eat our barbecue Memphis style, we just gotta get used to Four Rivers, which isn't that bad of a deal. <laughs> We used to love the relationships we had overseas or the ones that we had in that city or when we were in college, but, but now we've got to embrace the relationships that are being made right here and right now. Let's just dispel the myth. It will never be like what we had, but it will be exactly what God knows we need right now if we're willing to embrace it. Are you willing to embrace it? Invest in where you are. Be patient with the process. And thirdly, enjoy the moment. Just enjoy the moment. God tells his people in this text to get married, which seems so interesting to me, right? Like, put yourself in the shoes of the Israelites. You're living in a place that you didn't want to live in. You're moving to a place where you don't know the language, and you don't know the people, you don't know the culture, and everything is different. And in that setting, God's saying, I want you to settle down, get married, have babies, and have your babies have babies, Right? I saw a guy go, yeah, have babies, amen, right? Like, that's, that's where it's at. But here's the question. It seems so uncertain. Why would I settle down? And why would I celebrate the moment? In Jewish culture, marriage was a moment of celebration. But what is there to celebrate when you're asking these questions? Well, what if we move again? Have you thought that before? What if the boss changes his mind? What if King Nebuchadnezzar says, we can't live here anymore? What if the boss says, I've got to get moved? What if the kids don't adjust? Should we have just stayed where we were? Are these not questions that we ask sometimes? And these types of questions can become so paralyzing, can't they? They become the types of questions in our own life that begin to hinder our own process and prevent us from experiencing what God has for us right now. We feel bad because finding new friends feels like we're betraying the old ones. We feel afraid to give ourselves fully to anything because we're afraid that we'll have to leave it. We feel disconnected because we don't know if it's worth trying again. But in Jewish culture, marriage was the epitome of celebration. And what God is saying to us today, if you're in the middle of transition, is celebrate the moment. Enjoy the season you're in. Plan to stay. You know, there's this image of a, a couple that got married during Hurricane Harvey that I think like, it demonstrates this so well. 
This is a family who were planning to get married the day that Hurricane Harvey hit in Houston. And they had, of course, cancel all of the things that they had planned, their caterer, uh, the person that was going to marry them, the, the venue for the reception, all of that stuff. And in the middle of that chaos, as the hurricane passed through, as soon as they could, they decided to walk out into a floody street and get married anyway. And in that photo, didn't it seem like there's great joy and celebration in that moment? Yeah. Because even in the midst of chaos, even in the midst of uncertainty, even in the midst of not knowing, we have the freedom from our God to enjoy every ounce of right now. And he wants us to. Did you know the Lord delights in you delighting in life? He loves to see you happy. He loves to see you full. And I think for some of us, as we would kind of navigate this process of transition in the midst of our life, some of us waiting on children, wondering if it's going to happen. Some of us wondering, are, are we going to uh, get married? Is that even going to be an option for me? Some of us wondering, am I going to get the promotion? Some of us wondering, are my kids ever going to adjust? Some of us wondering, is this really the church that we should be a part of? Is this, it's not like where we came from. As we're asking all of those questions, I want you to know that the Lord says, you're not going to find the answers to those questions until you make the first decision to plan to stay by investing where you are by being patient with the process and by enjoying the moment. And in so many ways, this decision and this choice is the gateway that opens us up to future opportunities of connection with God. We don't have to live in where we were. We don't have to focus so much on where we're going, but we get to experience and enjoy God in the moment right now. Because the reason why you are where you are is because God has something for you to see. And until we allow our eyes to see it, we might just stay where we are. With that in mind, I want to set aside some time in our gathering to, to actually just have an honest conversation about transition. The fact that it is tough the fact that it is hard. And I have some people, some other voices, share their stories and their journeys. So would you put your hands together for Jen Stoltzfus and Eric and Gina Butts as they come to the platform. Thank you. It's a tight fit. So... These three people are some of my dearest friends, and what I value so much about them is their willingness to share openly and honestly. So even as you hear their stories today, um, I pray that what you would see in them is a reflection of what we desire for our entire church, is the kind of connect, connection and belief in one another that we have uh, as our hope for everybody, that we would find friends like the friends that I found in these people. And so with that in mind, I'm going to ask you some pretty invasive questions today. <laughs> So I hope that set things up well. The first one is this. Uh, Jen, what have you found? And maybe just share a little bit about your story and then answer this question. What have you found to be tough about transition? Aside from everything. <laughs> um, so I am on staff here at Nona Church. I'm the Women's Director of Student Ministries. And um, I left my college town um, several years ago where I had lived for about seven years. Um, it didn't take me seven to graduate, just for clear. Stayed there after. Six. It took six. That's six. All right. six and a half. Yeah. Right. No. Um, and so I moved to Dallas, and I lived in Dallas for two years before I moved to Florida. So those were the two biggest transitions. I moved to Dallas, where I didn't know anyone. I had a friend move about 30 minutes away within a close amount of time as when I first moved, but it still felt very distant, and then moving here. So I would say the hardest thing for me about transition um, would be moving to a place where I felt so unknown, and I didn't realize how significant it was to me until I realized that it seems like everything around me was pointing to the fact that I didn't belong. That was kind of that phrase I kept hearing. So I would get in the car to drive somewhere and realize I had no idea where I was going. And all I could feel was, you don't belong here. You're not known here. And so even my GPS was like, come on, I just wish I could get somewhere by memory. And so that um, was the most tangible of what reflected a 
a large amount of my relationships and friendships and even ministry working in a relational position where I didn't know anyone felt the same thing coming here, being on staff at church and asking people, oh, is this your first week? This happened so many times. Oh, we've been here 15 years. I'm like, cool, like, sorry. <laughs> so that feeling of unknown, and I think part of that was knowing, you know, I had lived in these places for so long. It's gonna take so much longer before I feel connected in this place. Like, I can't wait seven years to have relationships. So it's challenging. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, um, we started our married life in Minnesota and then we moved to China and then to Singapore and then back to China and then here and in the midst of that lived in like eight different houses. So, um, yeah, we, we know transition and, um, I think for me what's hardest is, um, feeling the loss of identity in so many different ways, feeling like you lose the connection with people that you had and the ways that you felt like you knew what you were doing and how to navigate life and just the ways that you were able to contribute to and, and to serve in your world and people don't, don't know what you can do. And I, I often say it feels like being taken out of um, a, a swimming pool where you know the edges because like you know the definition of your life and then you're just dropped in the ocean and you don't know where solid ground is and you don't even know which way to swim um so I think that's um yeah that's what's really challenging I think in the midst of that there's so much desire that gets stirred up and it's hard to know like your heart just gets a little overwhelmed by everything that that raises in you yeah like has been mentioned um there we go <laughs> We moved eight times in 15 years, and I think as I reflected on that, it's tough because I thought of two things, um, uncertainty and being pushed out of your comfort zone, hmm. right? Like we've been talking about whenever, whatever the, and it doesn't have to be a move, it's a job change, it's whatever transition, right? We get pushed out of our comfort zone and things are uncertain and that causes fear and anxiety and lots of other, emotions and so you know and I I think a lot of us love and long for like me comfort and security and change just pulls those things away mm -hmm. but the good thing is it then if we're willing God wants to point us to the the one thing the one person the one relationship that will never change and is always certain and yeah. secure and so that's the good the hard side of it is it's uncertain and uncomfortable, but the good side is it can really point us to security and certainty and hope in the Lord. Um, maybe all of you guys don't have to answer this one, but what have you found to be essential to making home or finding home in the midst of transition? So Jen, this has been a year for you. You know, I'm just kind of thinking, what, what are the essentials to that? Yeah, so for me to kind of combat combat that feeling of being so unknown. Um, I had to make a decision both in Dallas and here um, that I was just going to invest um, right away and I was going to allow myself to be known where I wanted to just say, no one knows me, why even bother trying to build those relationships or why even wait so long before I even can recognize or like name 10 people in the church I work for, right? Um, but deciding like, okay, the only other option is to put myself in positions where I can be known and to kind of lead out and vulnerability where people all around me seemed like they had their circles or their people, but doing the hard work of saying like, hey, you know, can I insert myself into these places and knowing that um, no one knew that I was feeling lonely unless I said that I was feeling lonely, right? So allowing that vulnerability to be what um, allowed me to feel known, knowing that I was in a community that wanted to know me and invest in me, um, that wasn't the challenge. It was just making that decision. I found it really important to make the decision to be known, but in that to remember that it was the Lord who brought me here and that he um, doesn't make mistakes and he does um, good things for his people, right? He withholds nothing good from those who love him, yeah. Psalm 84, 11 says. And so knowing that the Lord had allowed me to be here in this season, then there was a purpose for it and I could respond and trust um, by stepping into that vulnerability. Yeah. So Gina and Eric, what would you share with people who are walking through transition right now? I mean, you guys have had some seasons of that uh, and how would you encourage our friends and family to engage the, the honest reality of transition? Yeah, I think one of the things I've thought a lot about recently is how... Um, you know, we come into a transition with a lot of needs and we have expectations and hopes about how those needs will be met. 
Um, and I think we have to hold those loosely because I found for me in transitioning here, I had these ideas like, well, I want this for my kids and I want this for myself. And I was spending a lot of energy trying to make those things happen. And, and I felt like I was so focused on how I thought they would happen. And I, one day I just felt like God was saying, Gina, I can make those things happen, but I might make them happen in a different way. Mm. And so I just made a list and I, I just wrote at the top, I was like, if, if they're gonna happen, God will make them happen. And just like, wouldn't even pray through them, just like every day, just like, Lord, here's my list. And when I did that, I felt like I, I started to see ways that he was fulfilling those needs in other ways that I wasn't looking for. Mm. And, and so it started really pushing me to practice gratitude and, and just thank him for all those little things that I was seeing. And then I started to see them more and more. So I think just being open to how is God gonna settle you in this new place. That's good. Why don't you bring us home? Sure. Um, I think the point you made about investing is so critical. Whenever we moved into a new situation, we didn't know how long we were gonna be there or if I'd be in the same role and so there's a lot of uncertainty, but despite that, we just decided up front, like, we're going to make this home. And I think we sort of learned that over time. One, in the actual physical home, like, we made sure to unpack our boxes and hang a few pictures and make it feel like home. Mm. Helped a lot. But even more importantly, in relationships, uh, we decided we're going to invest in people right now, even if it means they might leave or we might leave, uh, and that's going to mean a tearful goodbye at the airport. We want, it to, we want to be where we are. And our last year in Beijing, there was a family that came in and we, we thought we were gonna probably leave and we're like, we only probably have nine months, but this family seems like we'd really get along with them. And so we decided, despite the short time frame, we're gonna go all in and get to know them. And they became some of our best friends in that short time. Our kids were like, why are these people always coming over to dinner at our house? Like they were kind of <laughs> wondering why we're spending so much time together because the Lord just bonded us in that short time. Yeah. And so those short-term investments can result in long, lifelong relationships. And so the, I encourage everyone to consider how, to, how that, they might live that out now in your situation. That's awesome. Can we put our hands together for these folks? All right, can we be honest with each other? Can we have a, can we have a moment of honesty? Are you ready? Planning to stay is scary. It is scary and frightening because it feels so permanent, doesn't it? Like, don't we like options, right? We go to the Cheesecake Factory and feel like this is my kind of restaurant because there are a lot of options. And choosing to stay Planning to stay, man, it is a scary, scary thought. Permanence for some of us, not, not all of us, but for some of us, it creates this sense of emotional claustrophobia that is nearly unbearable. But here's what I'm learning. Until we are willing to stay, we won't experience why God sent us here in the first place. And more importantly, it's the only way we're ever going to know or have peace as to whether or not we are supposed to leave. I remember a few years ago, Stacy and I had an opportunity to take on a ministry position in another city. Um, at that time, that would have made me the youngest megachurch pastor in America. Now, you've got to understand that when Stacy and I left Orlando for college, uh, we both vowed to each other that we would never, ever move back to this crazy, hot, humid place called Orlando, Florida. It was like the one, it was like our wedding vows and that vow. Like those things were packaged together. <laughs> At first, what we wanted was four seasons and a big city and good public transportation. That's our dream, right? And by the time we had our first kid, we just wanted good school districts, a decent yard, and neighbors that weren't creepy. <laughs> <laughs> but when this opportunity came up, gosh, I remember feeling like this move was gonna check all of the boxes for me. It was gonna be a place that we enjoyed it was gonna be a financial package that would amply provide for us, and it was gonna be a ministry in a place that was doing good work that I cared about. And the more that I processed this role, the more I realized that part of the reason why I couldn't take it is because I didn't have a peace about it. We just sensed that God was giving us a test to see if we would trust him to provide for our needs and fulfill our hearts. But more than that, I think part of the reason why we didn't feel a sense of peace to take that opportunity is because we had never made the decision in our own hearts 
that if God had us stay in Orlando, and if God had us stay in this church that we called home for this season of time, that if that's what he wanted for us, we would be okay with it. Not only would we be okay with it, but we would celebrate the fact that he was going to use us in that way. We had never made the decision in our head and in our heart to say, we are going to stay. And I remember making the phone call to turn down the opportunity, looking at Stacy, saying, until we embrace where God has us now, we will never be able to know if we were ever supposed to go in the first place. So here's why deciding to stay is so important. It's not because planning to stay means that you're forever hooked to where you are and shackled to that place, but it's actually the key that unlocks the shackles so that you can actually know as you make decisions in life if the decisions you're making are because of God's call, if you're running to something, or if you're running away from something. And man, as I even look across this room, I've had conversations with you. We've had lunch, we've sat down and had coffee. You've deliberated about whether or not you should take that job or promotion. If you should pursue having another child or not or build your family. If you should move into that neighborhood or stay where you are. If you should use your resources in that certain way. And I think for so many of us, part of the reason why we never find peace about what we should do and still stay paralyzed where we are is because we never made a decision in our hearts to say, I'm gonna stay. And if we're honest, we begin to realize, man, I think I might actually be running away from something instead of running to something. And the peace that comes when you plan to stay is a peace that changes your everyday life because it allows you to see what God is doing right now. So let me ask you this question. At your job, thinking about that promotion, Have you planned to stay? If you have, then you're going to have a better sense of peace as to whether or not you should move on. In that relationship, if you're dating right now and you're wondering if you should move towards engagement or if you should break it off, or is this really going to be who I'm going to marry? Have you planned to stay? Have you made that decision in your mind and allowed yourself to live it for a while and allow the Lord to direct you? Because it's really hard to move a parked car. It's a lot easier to steer it when it's in motion. For those of us that are thinking about church, have you planned to stay? Because here's what I know. The longer we sit consuming, the less we're likely to contribute over the long term, and we end up leaving because we never had roots down in the first place. And as it pertains to the season of life you're in, have you made plans to stay? Have you decided, I'm going to invest where I am, and I'm going to push my chips in 100%. I'm not going to hold anything back. I'm just going to push in 100%. Have you been willing to say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to plant here. I'm going to plant some roots here, and I know it's going to take time for there to be fruit, but I'm going to be patient with the process because it's worth waiting for. And have you chosen? Have you made the decision to say, I'm going to enjoy this moment? I'm not going to begrudge the fact that I can't go back to where I was. And I'm not going to spend so much of my time and energy daydreaming about what's going to be one day, but right now I'm just going to enjoy the moment. I'm going to celebrate the fact that I've got one friend in this new city or that I make one step forward in my, with my boss or in my relationship. Have we made those decisions? Because until we plan to stay, we will not be able to thrive in the land between. And get this, when we get to where we're going, guess what we now are in? a space between where we were and where we're going. So until we learn how to do this now, we'll never be able to experience the life that God had for us. So many of us say, I want to see God. Well, you can't see him until you're willing to plan to stay. Because when you stay, that's when you see. When you stay, that's when you see. With that in mind, would you just bow your head and close your eyes with me for a second? I want to give us a few moments to just reflect on this truth. You know, the idea of planning to stay is not something that is just found in Jeremiah. In fact, it's, it's exactly what Jesus did for us. John 1.14 says this, So the word became human, meaning God became a man, and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Jesus came, and he made his home among us. Jesus invested where he was. 
Jesus was patient with the process. That's what he did. Jesus planned to stay. And in three short years, he would change our eternity and teach us how to do it. So are you investing where you are right now or are you just waiting? The longer you wait, the less fruit you'll see. Are you being patient with the process? Are you hitting the eject button on relationship too fast or the eject button on your um, work too fast? Is that what you're doing? And are you enjoying the moment right now? Like, Lord, thank you that you brought me here. I know you brought me here for a reason and purpose. And I'm gonna enjoy this season because I know you got something to teach me right now.